Introducing first. With a record of one win, three defeats, representing the Real Rejects channel on YouTube's Greg and John, it starts the Real Rejects. They're here. They're here. Yep. They've got a top go. ten board here. There we go. Paying a little respect here. The top ten. They got a top ten board. What are they doing? They just Oh, oh my! my oh my! Look at that! Is that working out? Did he break the TV? That's all I care about. But it might have been worth it if it did. It yeah, might have been worth it. That's going to be slow motion. That's going to be memes. That might be the highlight of their night. Though. It Ooh. might be. If that is their highlight, that was impressive. I pulled a hamstring. Hello, Reject Nation. I'm Greg Alba. I'm Andrew. So we're going to review the Defenders today. Mm. Full on uh, series of uh, stream of consciousness thoughts. <laughs> on, spoilers. Uh, spoilers and everything there. And uh, yeah, through uh, go check out the Schmodown match that John and I were on if you haven't seen it yet. Um, I threw in my kick part because... That was uh, sick. I want to be Danny Ray. By the way, how much did it cost to get a stuntman to do to play you for that little bit? Well, the stuntman was only five hundred dollars, but digitally CGI my oh. face on his cost thousands. Dude, now I see where James Cameron got that inspiration, you know, for T two the three D for mm -hmm. redoing Arnold's face and this yeah. like with the stunt. We guys. showed him an early uh, dude, version of that. Now yeah. I see, dude, that was incredible. Yeah. You inspired a, like a new generation of yeah. filmmakers. I inspired the whole three D we released. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's good. I'm glad I finally got to see it in theaters. <laughs> anyway, let's uh, let's hop on to the defenders review uh so but uh, you know what I've, I've done you know most of the i've covered all the episodes essentially with quick thoughts on each episode and uh, i and the last one i gave my general consensus saying that the show was good i didn't find it great uh just really quick what was what was your overall thoughts on it all right so i've seen this show twice You've now seen twice yes, yes. so okay. the first time i saw it i did enjoy it I did feel there was, you know, some things uh, I had problems with here and there, like some tonal uh, def uh, inconsistencies, uh, the way uh, Sigourney Weaver's character, Alexandra, the way she's offed off, uh, the way uh, uh, Electra kills her off, I had a little bit of an issue, which I'll get to in this. Um, so, I mean, but a couple of things that I had other issues with, seeing it a second time, I actually, because I'm looking for these things now and I know what to expect, mm -hmm. I, I found myself enjoying this show a lot more the second time around. I can and see that. I, I, I kind of am with yeah. you. I, I'm not in, in a place where I'm, it's like Daredevil seasons one and two and I'm like, this is outstanding and incredible. But I'm kind of, more, but I'm not in a place to say it's it's just okay. I'm kind of more in the middle. Like it's, it's good. It's definitely I enjoy better it. than Iron Fist. Yeah, yeah. no, I'll definitely yeah, say that. Definitely but what that. I loved about this show too is the character interactions, the human depth and emotion. Like we are so invested in these characters, and obviously so from their previous shows. And but you made a point. A lot of people weren't a big fan of uh, of Finn Jones as Danny Rand, Iron mm -hmm. Fist. So I thought he did a lot better job in this. The fight choreography, while not fantastic, like in Daredevil season one and two or seasons one and two, I did still think they did a pretty good job. There are definitely moments where the camera is fast it's cutting. like a little CW-like. Well, yeah. also, too, a little Christopher Nolan and Batman Begins where it's yeah. happening so fast. You're like, what yeah. just happened? I can't really tell what's going on. So, But there definitely were moments where some tracking shots, other other moments during fights where, and, uh, where you're like, this is really cool and entertaining. Not to the level of what you probably would have wanted, but it still did the job enough to... To get you entertained. I, I feel like it didn't do the job. Uh, and well, I want to go into some pros in a second because I know when you start off just with the, with the criticisms, people are like, you hate this show. Um, but uh, while we're on the subject of the fights, I, I feel like uh, when it comes to the fight scenes here, the, the main reason it bothered me is because there was a huge backlash with the way the fights were handled with Iron, Iron Fist. Fist Season 1 after coming off of you know Seasons 1 and 2 of Daredevil. And I thought, like, well, you have Daredevil in here. And you're, you're crossing these people over. You should have like the same level of direction at least. If the choreography is not even going to live up to the the caliber of Daredevil, then at least have the action direction of it live up to that caliber instead of all the crazy cutting and editing and you know all, all that. Because I'm like, well, you know, Luke Cage and Jessica Jones, they don't have a fighting. They style. don't really have a fighting style. They're just strong. Bur they're just brutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all they are. And so I don't expect a lot from them. And a lot of the way Daredevil moved was still really cool. It's just the overallness of it, you know, especially when they're fighting the hand in the end, the last couple episodes, I'm like, 
They're the hand. And I thought these were a bunch of skilled warriors. Why are they all just a bunch of henchmen who are easy to take yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say too when you said in in regards to martial artists, like Danny Rand got his ass kicked quite too a many bit times. A lot of yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I don't mind, and I don't mind him getting his ass kicked a little bit because we want our heroes to feel some tension and some danger. So you know we feel that, but it just it was too much sometimes. Yeah. And I'm glad towards the end he finally got to really kick some ass, which was good. But it just it didn't pay off the way I personally wanted it to. And in, in regards to Iron Fist being the best martial artist in the world. And I know that there a lot of people have cases for Daredevil being a better martial artist. What I don't even want to get into the argument of that. I just want to say like it just never you never get the sense that Danny Rand is the greatest martial artist in the yeah. world with or without his iron fist. True. And I, that's I, what I want to feel. I, I I wholeheartedly agree with that. As far as uh pros go with this show, I feel like the strength of this specific series. And, I, and when I say this, I'm not entirely sure my feelings on it yet are because of the expectation of seeing a crossover show, or um, it just lacked whenever the characters weren't intertwining with each other. But the interactions between the four main defenders were great. Mm -hmm. And especially when you break them apart, because every time they interacted, especially by episode four when they're hiding out in the restaurant, I loved all that. Like, there's pretty the much Royal no... Dragon. The Royal Dragon. Yeah, I think that's what the episode's called, actually. And the entire interaction there was fantastic amongst the four of them. And then when you even divide it up, I think Danny Rand, Heroes for Hire. Finn Jones, Heroes for Hire, teasing all that. But just importantly, like, their relationship, their dynamics, those two actors working together, I felt Mike Coulter brought out a better performance of Finn Jones. I was... Anytime Finn Jones is just... Casually being Finn Jones and not being, I'm Mr. Intense, shaking my head about everything. When, yeah. It's just, hey, I hate that head shake. He does that. Yeah. It's like, I, I know what he's trying to do. He's trying to do contained anger that yeah. wants to come out, but it's just so, like, over the top. Yeah, no, um, I feel you. But it, regardless of, the, of those kind of things, their interaction, their chemistry is great. Mm -hmm. When Daredevil and Jessica Jones are alone with each other, their banter back and forth is great. When they start getting along and understanding each other and joking around together, that's all really fantastic. So the big strength of this show and the thing that you want most from it is really strong here. When they're all together, that's when the series is at its best. So you got to give this show that. Whether or not you find the show a disappointment, that is all great when they're all interacting with each other. Yeah, no, I agree with that. The char the main f uh, strength of this show is the characters and the character yeah. interactions. And again, the depth and the human emotion, how invested you get in these in these characters interacting with each other because again we've already we've if you've watched the other shows you're already familiar with these characters and you should already be invested with them yeah. to some extent but seeing them interact with each other how's that going to work and i thought it all really worked well and plot wise it, it made sense why they were all working uh it you did. know it working did. together so it wasn't like uh, this is kind of forced. No, it organically ended up working together. But yeah, like you said, those are the things that I enjoy the most are their interactions whenever they're together, whenever they're fighting together mm -hmm. too. But when they break up and and they start doing like uh, two on twos more when they're yeah. uh, when they're talking, like like you said, Heroes for Hire, uh, Mike Coulter, and uh, or rather Luke Cage and Danny Rand. Those are some of my favorite scenes in the entire in all eight episodes because, like you said, Mike Coulter brings out something in Finn Jones where he's just relaxed. He's just being himself, and I know yeah. he's playing a character. He's not playing Finn Jones, but he just, like you said, he's not trying to be like that child with that inner anger. Where he's, hey, I'm Danny Man, yeah. you know, he's not, he's not trying to do that. And I just I appreciate those scenes more because you get more into the mind of the character without this, all this yeah. over the top nonsense. But those are my favorite scenes. I like how they're teasing Heroes for Hire. That the, that stuff seems very interesting. I love too during the show how they all back on Iron Fist. Like uh, yeah, Jessica yeah, Jones yeah. is calling him Ironclad, and and then he's making that's fun nice, of him. That's nice. he's a regular, yeah, 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 he's making fun of him for uh, punching uh, the molten heart of the dragon. He's yeah. like, dude, I'm just kidding. And then uh, my fa I think one of my favorite quotes in the entire show is from Stick, where he says, "The immortal Iron Fist is still a thundering dumbass." Yeah, yeah. I, I, lo I love all that stuff. And again, the the show is written pretty well in terms of dialogue and character interactions. I thought that that was very strong. Wrong. Um, but uh, like, like, one, and also, yeah, sorry, go ahead. What were you gonna say? What, what, <laughs> one thing I gotta give the show credit to beyond the four main defenders interacting, I what I really appreciate about this is something that uh, the, the, that the show is able to give us that when you think of like the Marvel movie crossovers that they don't really give us so strongly is the supporting characters get to have a lot to do in here too. 
beyond the four main defenders, you get a pretty good amount of calling. You get pretty much calling wing throughout this whole series. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of stick in here. You get Electra. You get to see Foggy and Karen. Like, they all get storylines. Misty Knight, especially. Malcolm. Malcolm they Trish Walker. Trish Walker. Hellcat. They all be, they're all able to get storylines and have special scenes there. Like, one of my favorite, like, fan service moments was when they're in the precinct, and then you have all the supporting characters from the, the supporting, like, protagonist characters all in, uh, in, the, same in the same hideout room. That was a really d big delight, because we were like, oh, yeah, a lot of these guys haven't met each other yet. Even Carrie Ann Moss makes an appearance in the right, show. Right. Jerry Hogarth. Jerry Hogarth, yeah. And so there was, there was a lot of that that I really appreciate they went out of their way to do. More than just blend the four main defenders, we also got to see the supporting characters that we love as well. But I think what I liked about it the most was, it, again, it felt very organic. It's not there. They're just, it's not feeling forced. Yeah. Or like, why are all these characters in this room? Why are they all like meeting with each other? Again, it felt very organic. I like seeing them all in there. And like you said, I like that they all had something to do not obviously major because they're more hiding in a precinct at some point but again those interactions just pay off in a way that I appreciated and you know from where they take off in the shows and also I like that they do a lot of foreshadowing for what we're going to see in the future shows with these characters mm -hmm. with the when they're talking in, uh, about things like yeah. we even see like one easter egg I believe was uh, uh, on one of the buses when uh, with Luke Cage in episode one or two you see it says new Harlem Renaissance that's of course is a that during one of the transitions yeah yeah, yeah but yeah. that's that's obviously a foreshadowing to uh, Mariah and Shades their new business in Harlem. So, and then you were also mentioning some MCU uh, crossover stuff. Uh, the the stuff I noticed from you know what they mentioned about MCU crossovers, I noticed they said they talked about the incident. And that's of course the Battle of New York that happened in the climax of Joss Whedon's The Avengers in 2012. They also, if you remember, in Karen Page's office, which is Ben Urich's old office that she took over, who uh, of course they was had killed. a Hulk thing there, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah there yeah. were two articles. There was one of the Battle of New York, and there was also one that said Harlem Brawl on it. That's the fight between. Between Hulk and Abomination yeah. in 2008, the the Incredible Hulk, I believe it was Louis Letier, the director yeah. of that. Uh, but uh, that so again, you see the connections there. And then also too, uh, I was trying to look and see if there was an Avengers Tower run. I I couldn't spot and notice it. But then if you remember in Spider-Man: Homecoming, he did sell it. Hopefully, yeah, presumably so to Oscorp, Norman Osborn, yeah. I'm hoping. But the question is, what specific timeline is the Defenders on when it comes to... I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah, we're going to get all that. It doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. matter. Yeah, it's not... That's it doesn't not matter important. for this, though. Yeah, but again, it's cool that they make they make a little bit of a point to, to mention yeah. some MCU crossover yeah. stuff. I mean, if there's something the show did well in, in the end of it, because I have problems with its ending that I'll get into, but uh, it does set up the solo shows in a good way, too. You know, like with Iron Fist, I, I was like, uh, is that is that his official new suit? Like the green jumpsuit I he mean, had on? I guess technically. He can obviously evolve. I mean, we saw Daredevil's suit evolve from the end of season one to season two. They made it a storyline how they cracked with the helmet and then yeah. he got kind of the new suit. Or the new helmet, rather. So, I mean, I'm hoping that's not it. He's got to wear the mask. He's got to wear the mask. Yeah, because we, we've clearly seen now in this show, he's inspired by by Matthew Murdock, by Matt's sacrifice in the end there, and to protect his, uh, uh, my city. So, yeah. you know, that, that and he, he was inspired a lot by Matt, by how Matt sacrificed himself, how much he cared about his city, and he understands that's his duty now that the hand is, I guess, technically gone, even though we think that Elektra and Madame Gow are still alive out there. But most of the hand has been destroyed now, so now Danny Rand's taking it upon himself, you know, to have that inspiration yeah. of being like uh, He's Matt finally going to be a vigilante in New York. Man, I want to see him wear that mask, too. Yeah, yeah and because uh, Iron Fist Season 1 did not give us a vigilante in New York <laughs> of, uh, of Iron Fist. Not really. And it also sets up uh, Colleen Wing and uh, Misty Knight, uh, dragons dragon. and, Daughters, Daughters of the Dragon. dragon. Yeah. Daughters of the Dragon uh, coming together with her arm getting cut and off. Their interaction was very interesting too. When they're yeah. talking about, and again, the arm being cut off that happens in the in the comics. Uh, she gets her arm uh, it, in an explosion. Her arm comes off. Tony Stark actually gives her that binary arm or that bionic arm rather, and uh, I believe it's got superhuman power. It's got super strength, superhuman powers. Kind of like Winter Soldier. Yeah, kinda, yeah, yeah, very similar actually to that, and. Uh, so that and now we know in this, Colleen Wing mentioned that Danny Rand's got some connections, or rather that he owns the hospital. So he, we know that he's yeah. kind of taking the place of Tony Stark a there. Billionaire and, playboy. Yeah, but I, I like <laughs> yeah. how though, yeah. it, and we got the origin of call of uh, rather of uh, Misty Knight getting her yeah. arm like that. So that was really cool. I thought plot wise it made sense, and kind of too they're t uh, going on a little bit of Easter egg here, going on with the loss of limbs of like Star Wars, where in all the original ones someone yeah. loses an arm. That's right, Marvel hand. likes to pay tribute. And to then that, yeah. and, and then Phase Two and. Uh, uh, you got a, uh, or rather, you got a uh, Iron Man three. Alfred Killian loses his hand. You got a uh, Winter Soldier and uh, loses his hand. Winter Soldier, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, Nebula loses her Civil hand. Civil War, he loses his hand. 
uh, Winter Soldier. I thought I'm, oh, I'm, no, 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 in Civil War he does, but I'm talking about when Arnim Zola replaced his arm with a vibranium gotcha. arm. Oh, yeah, yeah, and then, yes, Iron Man does smash up. Well, I'm yeah, talking yeah. about Mar uh, Phase 2 films. And then also, uh, I believe in Thor, The Dark World, a film I'm not very fond of. Uh, we see Loki pretend to cut yeah. off Thor's hand. So, again, they're just paying that, that loss of limbs, loss of hands, paying that yeah. tribute. So I thought that was really cool how they do that with Stick, too. With stick yeah. too. He lost his arm and how he escapes is just shows the resourcefulness, how much he's a badass. But... I think one of the biggest strengths of this show, not the way the character ends, is the villain, Alexandra. I, I really found myself very invested in this character. I thought she was sophisticated. She yeah. was intellectual. She took. She was. She had a presence about her. When she came into a room, I felt that she was menacing. She took control of that room. Like, And the other members yeah. of the hand, even though they started to question her in later episodes, at the beginning, you could see before she, she started getting yeah. all weak and all, how much they did respect her and have that fear level that's, for her, especially Madame Gao. That's so. funny you say that because... It did dawn on me before I shot this with you. Um, it, like I, I will go into my issues with her death uh, after. I know you have some issues with the death I do, too. I do. And because when when Sigourney Weaver is there on screen, she is perfect. She's perfectly She's cast in this role. She is multi layered. I love her introduction. It kind of reminds me of Wilson Fisk's introduction. Absolutely. In terms of like you see this villain, but she's introduced as this very vulnerable, lonely woman, like at the very top of her introduction. And then as it goes, you're like, oh, this is kind of a, she's sensitive, yeah, but she's a, she's one tough cookie who's pretty scary too. And she and, can and she's able to kick some ass. Too, she's able to kick saw. some ass too. She takes on Electra when Electra's reborn. And also, um, she she kind of some parts of her storyline remind me a little bit of Caught a Mouth. Yes, she gets killed off before the season wraps up, and Stakes. at the same time, um, you know, like the fact how Caught a Mouth never seemed to really be the one who had a one up on Luke through a lot of Luke Cage yeah. is kind of how I felt with Alexandra. It, and unfortunately, she gets killed off right when she gets her major one up on the Defenders. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I overall there's there's plenty to appreciate and there's plenty I really like. And, and in terms of other pros to it, I got excited for the Daredevil storyline. I, I know very little about the Born Again storyline, but when they does say Maggie, I was like, oh yeah, that's Daredevil's mom right there. And uh, we haven't seen Daredevil's mom in anything yet, so I'm excited to see her be included. I don't think in this. Matthew Murdock has seen her in anything either. That's true. That is true. Just, so just when he point, was coming out of the vagina. Just pointing out the obvious. Yeah, yeah. And after the radio had That's when he someone. could see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So, yeah. Sorry, sorry I didn't interrupt you there. I thought that was a good uh, time to say that. Yeah. Just clear that clear that up. That Matthew and, has not seen her in a yeah. very long time. And uh, with Jessica Jones, I, I felt it essential that they had to do her in the beginning of the show dealing with the repercussions of what happened with Kilgrave, and now we don't have to deal with that in season two of Jessica Jones. We could just hop onto our next adventure with Alias, Alias. baby. And, uh, yeah, so I, I felt like there was plenty to go... Uh, there was plenty of good things, though. But However, uh, there were there were things that were... And there were times I genuinely laughed a lot. I, I gotta give it that, too. There were times I thought oh, yeah, no, the genuinely humor, funny. Yeah, the humor was very organic. Like I said, the script, the dialogue, I thought many times I wasn't really cringing or saying... That's pretty bad dialogue. I can't believe they said that line. Maybe yeah. one or two times I might have said that, but overall throughout the eight episodes, I found myself uh, thinking the humor was very organic, very appropriate. Uh, you know, they let dramatic moments sit when they needed to. They hit moments of, of humor. Uh, I, I think some of my favorite humor moments were between Jessica Jones and Matt Murdock. Absolutely. I, I think one in particular, my favorite, is when she sees him with the scarf. She's like, you look like an asshole. It's your scarf. Like, yeah. like you gotta get that one up on the yeah. humor there but I, I love those kind of moments and also too just f a little easter egg as well uh, when Matthew Murdock and Jessica Jones meet in the police station in the interrogation room, it really mirrors uh, visual imagery wise yeah. and also dialogue wise really mirrors uh, in Alias I believe it's issue number 3 when Matthew Murdock does the same thing, comes into the interrogation room, the dialogue and the visual imagery, like I just said, is very similar to that. So I thought that was cool how they kind of visually paid homage to that and, and dialogue-wise. So that was cool. And you pointed out best, I love their interactions together. They are so good together, those two. They have great humor. It's a good cat and mouse and, relationship. Yeah, it yeah. really is. And, and when they finally learn, when she like starts investigating more into him and into his past, like... Those moments really carry a lot of weight because she figures out who this guy really is, not behind all the gimmicks and the and the lawyer stuff and the and yeah. the daredevil. Like he's got a father who was a boxer and he was beaten up and he was a good guy. Like it was some really good uh, heartfelt moments. Like, like and that's what I mean by the human depth and emotion in the show. Like they really did in subtle moments. They really did a good job of painting that and making me feel again reinvested in these characters in a way I didn't think I could get yeah. to. So. I just appreciated that, and also too when they're uh, talking to I, I was it Lexi? I can't remember the little girl, the architect's the daughter. daughter. Yeah. I, Lexi, I can't remember her name. 
when Matt's playing the piano and they're looking for the blueprints, if you listen closely, it's He's actually... playing the it's Incredible the, Hulk tune. It is the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> from the TV show. should have played the Batman theme. That yeah. would have been ultra... Yeah. It's in the universe. But no, he was actually... He was playing the Defenders theme. And yeah. Dude, Matthew Murdoch, I gotta tell you, when he's honing in his Beethoven, his Mozart, he, he sounds pretty damn good. I would, pretty good. I would watch an entire season of just Matthew Murdoch playing the piano. Yeah. That's how good he was. But yeah, no, I'm, I, I kind of want to talk about Alexander for a sec. So Yeah, let's go into some cons. Uh, th- things that... When we go into the cons, I'm sure they're going to be cons that you find to be cons, and then cons that I find to be cons, and we'll probably disagree on some things. Um, but yeah, let's 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 start hopping into some stuff. You can go with Alexander. First. So, yeah. like I said, this character was very sophisticated, intellectual. She had that presence. I was invested with her, and whenever Sigourney Weaver's on screen, she's very three dimensional. She just takes over, and I, I'm I'm in. But my, my issue with her death, it's not that she had a death. I had no issue with that. That's not a problem for me at all. What I had an issue with was it happening in episode six. I would have preferred more like it towards the end of episode seven, maybe midway towards episode eight. And plot wise, I would have preferred something instead of Electra, you know, using the two sides on her and killing her after she had given the order to kill her loved one, to kill Matthew, the devils of Hell's Kitchen. She says her, his name is Matthew. I got where she was coming from. I understand what they were going for. I just think it would have been more dramatic and more compelling if like in the underground tunnel and the in the final cl- climactic battle yeah alexander has now been rejuvenated she's got the serum uh and she's able to she has her strength and she's able to kick some of the defenders ass which would in- increase the tension in that scene yeah. like they got alexandra back damn how are the defenders supposed to beat them which we'll go into all that in a second but i just think like let's say alexandra's got daredevil pinned down she's literally about to kill him whatever that's that moment when you see on Electra's face. Is she going to still serve the hand and, and trust her mentor? Or is she going to do the Darth Vader thing and save him with the Emperor's yeah. about to kill Luke? And, and now she's got to turn. And I, I know that would have felt a little similar to, to Return of the Jedi. You're already doing similar things to Return of the Jedi. You got uh, uh, Luke trying to see the good in his father. Matt's not trying to see the good in Electra. Also, you got some Winter vibe, uh, winter Soldier vibes in there with Bucky uh, and, and uh, Steve are fighting. And you know that you got that... That restraint because this is my my friend. I'm not gonna fight her. This is my loved one. I'm not yeah. gonna fight them. So I wouldn't have mind if they would have done something like that. It would have made the death again feel more dramatic and compelling. Like, damn, that is a worthy and satisfactory death. I mean, I'm sure there's many other ways I could have done. I just like I said, I was so invested and I found myself. I, I'm not gonna say I, I love this character as much as Wilson Fisk or the Purple Man, somewhere right around that range. But I will say I was really in, uh, invested in this character to the point of when the death happened, like. It kind of felt like a throwaway, irrelevant character, and I just yeah. it didn't hit me the right way see, I wanted it to that, hit me. That was that's my. You see, the funny thing is, is like when she died, that was a big oh shit moment for me, yeah. and it definitely impacted me. And I thought, see, my initial reaction was a little different. My initial reaction when she died was, oh, clever, Electra's main villain now. This is cool. It was when the next two episodes followed where I'm like, oh, it's like Alexander's presence never even mattered anymore. Yeah. Like she <laughs> you was know? such an irrelevant Yeah, character. it's like you forget about her. You you just completely forget about her. Pre- even Luke Cage goes out of its way to remind you of who Cottonmouth was after Cottonmouth dies. And here, it just makes the whole, the entirety of the hand feel even weaker. And I was already feeling like the hand is a pretty weak villain. I, after all the buildup we've gotten from... You know, teases of Nobu, Madame Gown, season one of Daredevil, and then like half, the last half of season two of Daredevil, all of Iron Fist, all of Defenders. And then in the end of The Hand, it's like, these guys seem easy to defeat. You, you just you never know. felt the stakes of the yeah, situation. It never Did you felt ever like, feel why like do you defenders? need all four of these guys? Yeah, you, you don't need all the You <laughs> never felt like they were really threatened to the point. Yeah. How are they going to defeat? And be, it's like Terminator 2 or Die Hard. How is Arnold supposed to right. defeat the T-1000? There, it's, and then when you see it happens, like that was... That was logic, yeah, I, it was satisfactory, and the stakes and the tension were at an all-time high. It, it never seemed like an impossible villain for them to defeat. And I feel like if you're going to cross over all four of these gotta guys, you got to do it. And on top of that, too, it's like this is a pretty big letdown in terms of who the hand is because the hand has been built up from so many different shows that this hand character, this, this whole organization, should have been more intimidating. It's like, what's the Japanese guy's name? Uh, Mirokame, I believe. Mirokame. It was so interesting to me how it was handled with this guy because his introduction was badass. His scenes with Sigourney Weaver are great. Their interactions, yeah. Yeah, and then they're setting him up to be this really lethal warrior. And then almost every scene he, he fights in, he just gets bitch slapped or knocked out like nothing. Yeah. I'm like, what is the point of this guy? No, I agree with you. The only thing that would kept me, other than the introduction and that fight scene with him where he kind of did take control and was being a badass, the thing that kept me invested with this character as someone I, I like found 
found myself like not rooting for, but like he's a he's a pretty interesting villain. Where his interactions with Alexandra, because the way he was challenging her, I'm like, this is some good. Yeah. I love seeing villains challenging other villains in the same organization. Like this is actually interesting stuff. I, I like this. I but again, his is is fighting like I just don't feel threatened whenever he's fighting yeah. the defenders. I want I, like how are they supposed to beat this? I never felt that. And all the skilled warriors are all just henchmen. That's all they are. They're just yeah, henchmen. and I think yeah. my biggest disappointment was Sawande when they showed him beating the shit out, or not beating the crap, but he was pushing Luke Cage around. He in was it, winning in the it, fight. Yeah, I was yeah. like, this is sick. And then when Luke Cage brings him, I'm like, I wanted to see that fight. I wanted to see how Luke finally was able no, to beat him, yeah. like because. It didn't look like Luke was having an easy time in any way. He was pushing him around because he was using yeah. the fingers from Kun Lun. So, and I got that. That was all compelling and interesting. But I'm like, I want to see that, that battle I between said that them. During when, my reaction, actually, like I'm so happy Luke got him. I kind of wish we saw this though, you know. And guys, this isn't us being negative anyway. These are just, in our opinion, things that could have made the show what we personally would have maybe yeah. wanted it to be. But again, I still found a lot of great things in this. I'm just, we're just going over yeah. some things that personally bothered well, you know, me. I just don't want to feel like this is totally negative because I no, did love a lot dude, of things. Dude, we spent in... like 15, 20 minutes covering a lot of positives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> if they made it this far, they, they should know. Um, when, when it comes to the hand, I feel like you were building up their master plan so much. And by the time you got to the final episode, it's, 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 very, it's very lackluster. I, I don't really feel like they're going to... I feel like they don't have a chance at succeeding. Yeah. And, and anytime they're fighting them, they're weak. And then making Elektra the main villain was a clever thing, I guess, on paper. But by the time it the happens, the fact that she doesn't even give a shit about the hand makes the hand just look even weaker in general. And then I'm like, I don't really care enough for them to take down Elektra. And I don't really find the hand that intimidating. Why are all four defenders together? I feel like Luke Cage and Daredevil could handle this all on their own. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, I feel. Like, and I mean, you pointed it out. Look, I, I would have, uh, I would have thought that uh, it would have been more compelling the way Alexander and then how she turns. That would have been more interesting. But look, the hand, I also thought too what would have been more interesting. Not only the hand with what happened with the city collapsing. I thought they were going after dragons or going after like becoming super powered beings, and they're gonna yeah. like. I thought it was going to be something they're like in that territory. Something just, huge. And I just yeah. and again, I, it is very threatening. The city collapsing in itself. It's just you never felt the stakes no. or the calamity of the situation. Like, oh, the city's gonna fall. Like, okay. I, I mean, that felt very. I guess like uh, it's more like Age of Ultron when you're seeing the city. This it's gonna fall. You know, the whole uh, yeah. Sokovia is gonna fall, and like the whole like you're feeling the visual imagery of the impact there. Like, if that thing falls, like everyone's gonna yeah. die. And I get it. They don't have the budget to compete with that, but. It's just the situation they concocted for all the defenders to come together. It's like, can we get a little better of a more menacing, you know, uh, version of what's going to happen to yeah. the city? And oh, I get it. It's, it's, I'm not saying not, it's not it's, threatening. It's not it impossible is. to ask for because I, I feel like my main issue with this show, and I feel like a lot of my issue that I'm about to point out, a lot of that, not all of it, but I feel like a lot of it could probably disappear with a second viewing. Um, is the structure and the tone of this show. Because the structure of this show kind of makes everything feel all over the place. It's like one might come in and say, well, no, Greg and Andrew, uh, they, they are saying New York City is going to collapse. But you're, you're not really fully thinking about that. That's not really at the forefront of your mind. It's in so many different directions, and not everything is fleshed out in, a, in a, such a clever, concrete way that I kind of feel like they were all over the place at times. With its tone, yes, especially, is because I feel like the first two episodes, here, here's how I would judge the show. The first two episodes, all set up. And the setup really took its time and felt a little dull the first time. But by the time I got to episode three, I was like, okay, I get exactly what they were doing. And they were just doing a lot of buildup and I'm grateful for it. Three, four, five, and six, it's, it's Defenders versus The Hand. And we got to figure What's out what up? they want to do with Iron Fist. Then... Alexandra dies, and That's the whole great. show fucking changes, <laughs> and, then, and it becomes like this 90s cheesy kind of territory, and it was that final two episodes, in, in terms of structure, that really, uh, it was the final two episodes that I felt kind of ruined a lot of the experience for me, because they don't even wrap up a lot of things. 
they, they set up a lot in the first two episodes with personal investments. Luke Cage is involved because of this kid from Harlem. Jessica Jones is involved because she feels... The architect. Yeah, because of the architect, and she feels for the architect's wife and daughter. And then when the time the show wraps up, we don't even get a, uh, like, what the hell is Luke Cage's arc in all this? Luke Cage has no arc here. He's just, yeah, I'm, I'm back in Harlem. And, like, nothing with the kid or the mom or that he goes and visits and has a really heartfelt scene. Yeah. Nothing with Jessica Jones and the I, wife and daughter. You're right with that, but I did like her arc in regards to just start restarting Alias again. Yeah, yeah. They got her back into and, that moment. And I so. gave it credit for that in the beginning yeah. of this review. I made sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you did, you did. I, I just wanted to also point that out. Yeah. I did appreciate that arc. But, no, you, you make a good point, and I think... I think you make also a good point in regards to a second viewing on the tonal uh, inconsistencies here and there, but the second time it really didn't bother me as much because again, you know what to expect. You know what you're getting in the first two episodes that are con- uh, gonna, you know, yeah. connect you to the next three. But four, did it change your three. experience with the last two episodes? As I feel like it would have changed my experience with the first two, but I, it wouldn't change. I my still, experience with the I still last had, two. like I said, I still had problems with Alexandra's death, how that was all handled. I think again, if you would have just kept her around for episodes seven and eight, rejuvenated her, and done that, it would have again fixed my experience with seven and eight and felt the calamity of the situation. It doesn't fix those moments for me, but, and one other thing I gotta mention, we kinda were uh, talking about flaws. Rewatching, I really noticed this. Jessica Jones, when they're escaping, uh, Electra throws one of the sides to stop the elevator. Jessica Jones then holds it, and I think Danny's like, holy sh- or something where oh, he yeah, says, like, they start climbing yeah, yeah and then they start climbing but then Jessica lets go of the elevator well, which room did that elevator come from it comes from the room where Matt yeah. and Electra are fighting in there's never no drops. impact it <laughs> yeah. never drops like I was waiting like five minutes like did that elevator not drop did it drop 20 minutes ago or Matt did and Gal see- was below it, it it's kind of like she rode the elevator yeah exactly <laughs> it's kind of like in Batman 89 <laughs> when Joker uh, you know uses the acid to take down the bell and it stops the police from coming in it's like if he would have done the acid with the bell and then it never dropped and the police never got in it's like wasn't it supposed to drop yeah, yeah, or something yeah. it's like I'm like, okay, so the, I, I know they have budget restraints, but did anyone not notice that in the editing? Like, uh, the bell or the elevator has not dropped. Yeah. I don't know, but. No, that's a good point. And I, I feel like with the lot, and I already said it in my, like, solo uh, reviews for mm. the episodes. It, it just felt like the last episode, especially, really bothered me with the way how it was handled. It felt like, you know, by the time, I mean, that, that last episode was called The Defenders. And then by the Very time they're title. they're un- by the time they're underground and they're all assembling and they do the cool tracking shot and, and paying homage to the Avengers, paying homage to the Avengers, and uh, and also you said the line light uh, light it up, or yeah, it? And it reminded me of Hulk smash. smash, yeah, it reminded me of that, and I felt like they were trying to make us feel. I felt like I could see what they're going for. They the want us to so. feel superhero time that's just and i'm like i didn't feel like it got there organically i felt like we kind of rushed to get to this feeling and i don't feel it because i felt rushed to get here this these solo shows the strength of it is that they're so opposite from the marvel movies the rated r version they're marvel they're dark and gritty they can get sexual they can get gory (laughs) you know like they can they're wait, wait a raw. second. Are you saying when Wilson Fisk decapitated that man with yeah. his ass? Come on, dude, that's nothing. They, they that's keep, weak sauce. You know, I want to make a little side note. Now you said Wilson Fisk. I I, I want to I want to harp on this too much because I want to finish my point here. But um, what I feel like, okay, you gave us Wilson Fisk, who was a great business villain, kind of like Alexandra. Yeah. If you gave us someone like Kilgrave, if you gave us a Wilson Fisk and Kilgrave like all together, a business person, a Lex Luthor type or Wilson Fisk type, and then someone with superpowers that can match Luke Cage, because that's what made Kilgrave intimidating, because he mm. could control Luke oh, Cage. Yeah, you can tell him what to do. Then, dude, like if you had Wilson Fisk and Kilgrave as the villains, that would have been a way more it, interesting no, show. Exactly. Yeah. They would have had all of them and even didn't make the mistake of killing Cottonmouth or Kilgrave and had yeah. all four of them there. Like, how were the Defenders supposed yeah, to defeat them? that would have gave the feeling oh. of, like, why? And then they when they out? defeat them, it's like, that was so yeah, satisfying. that was clever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I it's instead a missed of just, opportunity. Instead, of, like, when the way they defeat the hand, it's like, oh, they just used their typical martial arts moves. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. they would have had, if you think about it. If they did they, nothing clever to defeat them. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, they were just doing what they normally <laughs> yeah. do. But no, if you if you think about it, if they would have had those four villains, plus Alexandra, you still get the hand in there, because it's a it's a part of, of Alex, because she's the yeah. main finger and of the hand. they established that Wilson Fisk is, works with the hand. With Madame Gow yeah. and them, so... I, no, oh, it was a missed opportunity. Really could have done that. Would and again, maybe you need to add another episode or two to make it happen or whatever. And obviously, like we or said, yeah, or just make someone in the ham with with super superhuman abilities that are enough to make it be like well, because like when Luke Cage is going through these guys, I'm like. 
These guys don't stand a chance against they, the cage. They tried to yeah. establish that with Elektra as the black side. And I did notice more in the second viewing. She's she did, one person she, no, no, against four. No, 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 but she yeah. was knocking them around a good few times. And even when she killed Stick, she did knock them all out. Other yeah. than Iron Fist, who was already tied up. So they, I get where they were coming from. But again, you want to feel multiple than rather just one singular character. Yeah. And with those four villains... Oh, would have been so... It's not only compelling and dramatic, it just would have been more interesting with these four characters. Yeah. And and again, you said it best, it would have just been beyond satisfying if they and clever when they beat them. Like Because you can't imagine a scenario where the, even as powerful as the Defenders beating those four. And one thing I would have liked too, that I wish the show gave us, and I thought they were going to do it because... You know how the first couple episodes they hop back and forth between their solo stories yes and then you could see the different tint in the cinematography daredevils is red luke cage is yellow you know you know what i'm Jessica talking about Jones, purple. purple and then luke iron fist is green. green yeah so it, i love that and then when all the defenders got together they didn't try to have a specific look for the show that that's something i felt was missing for it was a distinct cinematography appeal to it as well and i, I was like oh, come on man you tease us with the first two episodes with like all like give us a cool color blend or something to have a really distinct visual appeal there no i agree and in regards to camera work too after we had just seen terminator 2 judgment day and seen what james cameron and adam greenberg did with the cinematography and that i know it's not fair to, to compare that's a hundred million dollar movie <laughs> to, a, to a marvel netflix show of course not i'm just talking cinematography wise when you watch the handheld stuff, what James and Adam were able to do in that, and then you watch some of the handheld stuff here, it's it can be a little intoxicating, and just yeah. with the, how the camera is rolling and moving, it's just I just I'm not again not comparing. I just wish uh, cinematographers and directors they would watch movies like Terminator Two and other movies of that nature, where you can see that blend of of handheld and and that visual look. Like it, it's it's a part of the director and a part of what they're going for, and it just it kind of makes yeah. you get more uh, cinematically invested in what you're watching. So. Yeah. I, I would. I agree with you. I would have visually appreciated that more. But my biggest thing was on some of the. It's, there were some episodes where the camera work was done tremendously, Absolutely. and I really appreciate uh -huh. like going in air vents, doing other shots and stuff like that. There were some really clever shots when Jessica opens a cupboard and you see it from from the cupboard. Yeah. There were definitely some really cool and interesting shots. It's just I had a lot of problem with scenes where people are standing around. The camera's all shaking and doing that. And it's, I don't mind that in moments with, of action or moments of when the characters are moving because then you feel more a part of the action. It's when characters are, are are standing around doing nothing and then the camera's shaking. It just it makes me feel very dizzy and it, me personally, it just hmm. gets me really intoxicated and I just don't appreciate it's those. It's funny. Kind of I have like exact opposite feelings on, on that. Really? I, I feel like that part of the problem with the action that bothered me other than its tracking shot uh, uh, and even in the hallway fight, they had some pretty cool shots in the hallway fight, um, was a lot Clear of times cuts. the action was like so heavily edited and so heavily handheld that I was like, what the fuck is going on in this fight? And then uh, I don't mind it in the scenes, but I can also see how that bothers someone. Yeah, but I, no, I can definitely. I agree see with that. what you're saying. I don't mind it in action scenes if you can see clearly what's going on. Yeah, there's with, a way to with, do with, it. Yeah, Daredevil with, season one does it a lot. Yes. Yeah. yeah well, and yeah. also they've got the fight, uh, the stunt guy and the fight choreographers for Winter Soldier doing that, so you yeah. can tell because the fight choreography in Winter Soldier and Civil War are some of the best I've ever seen it's in any amazing. Marvel movies. Because like I remember the fight with Nobu and Daredevil in season that one. That was a great. Fight. That's handheld. That's how but you, do you it. can still see what's going on. And it's still a very intense and gripping then fight. I wish they would rewatch that that specific yeah. scene and just continue you know, actually, to do stuff like actually, that. Actually, actually earlier I just rewatched the hallway fight, uh, not uh the Daredevil season 1 one, the one in, Pun in uh season 2 when Punisher's in the elevator. Right. And I'm like, man, there's nothing in Defenders that matches this at all. How about the scene yeah. in Daredevil Season 2 where Punisher's taking out all the people in, in the prison? Oh, yeah, yeah, like something the, like the that. The tracking shot and the handheld, yeah. like the way it's done. Like mm -hmm. I, want, I wanted to feel some of those moments. I of, felt like the, the last two episodes lost a lot of its grit, lost a lot of what makes these shows so appealing. And they started, it really feels like they were rushing it because they only had eight episodes left. Like, I feel like that sixth episode twist could have worked. If they had, uh, if they had one or two more episodes, I think maybe not a full thirteen, but one or two more episodes, allow it to flesh it out. Give time for Matt to grieve over Stick's death. I mean, fuck, oh, when, it felt like when, a nothing character when, when they weren't grieving. When Ben Urich dies in season one, we get like a whole episode dedicated to grieving over which, Ben Urich, which I'm yeah. happy about. But yeah. is Ben Urich more important than Stick? No, no, not in terms of like the relationship with the main yeah. protagonist. So. No, you don't. And another thing, I felt like. See, I really feel like a couple more episodes would have allowed them to like give a full conclusion on Luke Cage, full conclusion on Jessica Jones. And also, um, the other thing too was, there was a thing that they, I felt like they were gonna tap into, and this is why I feel like the whole setting up 
Iron Fist, you know, posing as Daredevil thing, a little forced. I get it's with the comics, but it felt a little forced here because there's a scene where Stick is talking to Matt about how Matt has to be the real leader. And they were hinting at that in moments, that Matt's becoming the real leader. And it's there are scenes where it's like Matt's taking charge. Mm -hmm. But he, he never fully gets there. And if he fully got there, if Matt fully got to be like, oh, he's the leader, even Iron Fist is like, you're the leader of this gang, then I would have really felt uh, Danny Rand being like, I have to take up the mantle, you know? That's when I would have felt it. I feel what you're saying. I think still, though, I, I agree with what you're saying. I still think the visual imagery and seeing that shot was, was badass. That's a and, badass and, shot. And the, tri yeah. and the trickery of thinking that it is Matt, Matt Murdock with, yeah. the, with the red building in the back. And then his fist comes up. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah no, right. no. And I, I got to tell you, I was really hoping to see double iron fist there. I thought that was that's the moment. What is was that going to happen? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> When's he gonna, when are we going to see the dragon, too? You don't yeah. think it's going to happen. I know because of the budget constraints. But uh, I mean, getting back into the uh, into the finale, I, I agree with you. We gotta also mention, of course, what happens with Matt, where we go into the Born Again uh, storyline from mm -hmm. from Daredevil, Frank Miller's Born Again storyline. Now, what happens in, in that is very similar to this in the Born Again comics, which I'm stealing from uh, Greg here. Uh, what happens in that is uh, Wilson Fisk, uh, aka the Kingpin, he beats the shit out of uh, Daredevil, uh, Matt Murdock, and he leaves him to drown in a in a taxi cab in the East River. Matt barely escapes. He goes through Hell's Kitchen. He gets to the boxing gymnasium where his father, I believe it was Jack uh, Murdoch, uh, the gymnasium where Jack uh, trained at, and that's where Sister Maggie, his mother, finds him and she nurses him back to health. So it's very similar, a lot of the visual imagery, especially when he's sitting on the bed with the, uh, yeah. the, with the uh, bandana, or uh, the, and, uh, the healing and, stuff on. And that's season two of Daredevil ends on a note with Wilson Fisk being like, give me information on Matt Murdoch. Yeah, yeah of course. Because so he's, he's going to find out who Matt is. Yeah, and yeah. I'm hoping... Obviously, I'm looking forward to seeing Wilson Fisk in season three. The thing I'm looking most forward to, I hope they go with Bullseye. I think that would be awesome. I know they were talking to Jason Statham in season two of Daredevil. That didn't end up working out. But I, and I know this kind of mirrors obviously what happened in the 2003 film Daredevil with Bullseye and Kingpin working Only together. Only if they bring Elektra back. Then it would be a little annoying. Well, I mean, she's then still Then it would be like, oh, it's a Daredevil movie. So she <laughs> yeah. still is alive. And, I mean, yeah, most likely, yeah. Yeah, so, but I mean, we'll see what happens with that. But I do think it is interesting how they're going with the Born Again storyline. I do wonder if they're going to go with uh, what happens in Karen Page in, in that comic because she has major drug problems and she even sells out Matt to the Kingpin. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> she has a major drug problem in that comic, so I wonder if they're going to tap into that in season three. We do know that Karen Page is going to be in the Punisher show, which comes out in November, so she's clearly going to go through some crazy shit in that that might, you know, uh, internally damage her men yeah. uh, mentally. So we'll see how that, uh, you know, tracks into this, because obviously she is feeling pain and loss from what happened in her mind, what she thinks happened to Matthew Murdoch. And I got to say, I really appreciated that moment, especially the second viewing where Foggy and uh, and Karen were seeing everyone's, all the defenders are coming back and being with their loved ones and they're waiting, yeah. they're waiting, they're waiting. I love how the camera just stays there and then it pans on to Foggy and to Karen. We see the emotional, uh, you know, uh, content that they have because of the, they've lost their friend and it's just, I really felt that a lot more the second time, just again, feeling that human depth and emotion and that investment you in know, these characters. You know what I'm not I looking forward to moments. though? what season three of Daredevil is going to have with those guys. Because <laughs> I already felt like the it's kind of was repetitive was very of repetitive. Yeah. I, and I, we don't want you to be Daredevil. <laughs> like, I get it. I get well, it. Well, he brought, he brought him the suit. Uh, yeah, I know. But, but he even reveals his true motives No, of yeah. course. But he knew the city but was... But then like, I'm like, oh, after all this shit, oh, it's going to be way more of that in Daredevil season three. <laughs> I agree with you, but from a plot point, my only defense yeah, of that sense. is... Yeah, it makes sense. No, no, no. From my only plot point is they love their friend. They don't want... Yeah, it makes like, sense. It's I mean, if sense. you were if you were fighting it's in a dare, annoying. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I feel you. Could they go with more interesting things to talk about and go over? Then just I don't want keep... you to be daredevil. I agree, but I, from I get why they do. It, I just though. want them to push the characters to a point where they can just accept Matt for who he is. Yeah, <laughs> no, like, no, they get there already. I agree with you, and I think moments of Claire where she says to Foggy in, in the last episode, she says, "You're you know your friend Matt since I've known him." Anytime he has his mind made, there's no talking him down. Like, I think they are yeah. getting to that point. I think they, they kind of went over that repetitive nature a little bit to show, you, like... Sorry, go ahead. Do Lord. you remember in season one of Daredevil when Foggy is having issues with Matt and then they have, like, I think it's the second to last or the last episode when with they the decide reveal. to work together? Right. Where Foggy's like, all right, let's do this. And then, like, there are times where Matt uses his skills to hear stuff and Foggy's like, this is cool. I want that back. <laughs> yeah. In the chair. Yeah. I want I want more of that. That was a Spider-Man Homecoming reference, just so you know, guys. Boom. 
and that reference of Spider-Man Homecoming is a reference to a lot of other things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, um, just, yeah, I agree with you. I would like to see... That, that definitely is more interesting situations that they can put yeah. these characters in. I agree. But again, if they don't do... If, if they do it again in season three where I don't want you to be Daredevil and that's a major drag thing, then I agree with you. Now we're getting a little bit repetitive. They've at some point got to accept Matt. But it, it didn't yeah. bother me as much because they didn't go into it like a crazy amount in this show. They did go into it a few times. But again... I understand where they're coming from. They care about their friend and they love him so much. And Karen does want him to change so she can be the yeah. man that she wants to be with one day. So I, I get where they're coming from. I, and, and I get why people can be annoyed and think it's yeah. repetitive. I, I get I get both arguments. And uh, I guess my last thing I'll point out is I'm pretty excited for what they're doing with Misty Knight. Misty Knight was a character I really appreciated in the Luke Cage show. I like what she did here a lot. I kind of like how she became that, you know, the cop character that works with the vigilantes and yeah. trusts them even if it means getting her in trouble. I like that approach I did with her. And even though I thought the whole Bakudo and Colleen Wing shit was also very repetitive, I, I thought that was like, I thought we wrapped this shit up pretty well in Iron Fist yeah. Season 1. We don't need more of this. But when they cut off her arm, I was like, oh, that's probably why they had all this shit, so we can get to here. That was cool. And I'm excited for where Colleen, where, where Colleen Wing and Misty Knight coming together. That's something I'm looking forward to. I agree with you. I'm going to get into Misty Knight in really quick in one sec before we wrap this up. I just want to mention one of my other flaws. I'm sure one of you guys can correct me in the comments. I didn't understand in terms of the resurrection. Oh, you mentioned it with the head, when the head gets cut off. Right? Yeah. Oh, okay, so we can yeah. kind of just... Never mind. All right, I'll go <laughs> from the Misty Knight part. I agree with everything you just said about Misty Knight. I Again, I was already invested with her from Luke Cage. See... My favorite interactions, obviously, whenever her, she's helping the team, I love that, but my favorite interactions came towards the end with her and Colleen Wing, again, setting up the Daughters of the Dragon. I really appreciate that stuff. I like, I hope that they, again, do, I'd like to one day see that, that spinoff show. I think that'd be fun and entertaining, because just, again, in those, the, those two minutes of that scene we, we had with them, I found myself really in, in, I, enjoying I what the, they were talking about. I get the impression that, that a lot of people Iron Fist don't season, like Iron Fist Rand. season two. <laughs> yeah, that Iron Fist season two. Dude, I want to see the flashback of the dragon. Yeah. The, everyone's like favorite parts of Iron Fist season two were Colleen Wing. Wing, so I'm like, they're probably just gonna give us a lot of Daughters of the Dragon. I'm cool with that, and we and do I'm cool with that. Yeah, yeah, we do know Misty Knight is a hundred percent going to be in Iron Fist season two. So if they do do versions and portions of that in season two, do do. <laughs> I'm going to be appreciative of that. But I again, I need to see that flashback of how he got the Iron Fist. I want to see the battle versus Shao Lao the Undying. I, I need to yeah. see that. Again, your I biggest concern is... I at least want to is, see Kunlun. Yeah, <laughs> no, I want to see that bit. too. But yeah. again, I, I'm not going to compare it, but are we getting dragons of the nature of Game of Thrones where that budget is up there and it looks incredible? Or are we getting this budget where yeah. it doesn't feel like... You know, they have a lot of money, like, especially in the climactic battle when you see they're in one specific area on the set. And it's like, are we going to expand it? Because there's got to be miles of the dragon yeah. fossils. It's like, we literally stayed stationary in one specific yeah. area. It's like, it didn't feel like the budget constraints are where you wanted it to be. So if we do get to see Shao Lao, I'm hoping that it's going to be something visually yeah. spectacular. One other mention, too, we got to talk about with Misty Knight in her in her hospital room with Cullen Wing. If you notice on the uh, the uh, the... What is that? The chart? writing board? The chart? Yeah, yeah. It says L. Carter. That's actually Linda Carter. She's the original night nurse in the comics. Uh, she Who, like Claire's been inspired by. Well, yeah, 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 Claire. And also, too, uh, she ha she helps the superhero. She heals them up. She also had a thing with Doctor Strange. Obviously, they didn't use that version in the Doctor in the 2016 Scott Derrickson Doctor Strange film. They used the Christine Palmer, Rachel McAdams version. So, uh, I don't expect to see that, but... I just wanted to point out that was a pretty cool that's Easter egg cool that Easter we got egg, to see yeah. Linda Carter. And also, that's obviously the name of the actress who plays Wonder Woman, Linda yeah. Carter. So, pretty cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we gave all our opinions here. Really quick, Andrew, just the... Why don't you give a rating uh, out of 10? I, I'd probably give this a, I'd like an 8 or 8.5, somewhere around there. I still, again, it wasn't what I wanted it to be, especially the last two episodes. Up From episodes 1 to 6, I really found myself enjoying everything. And again, there were things in episodes 7 and 8 that I didn't appreciate and enjoy. Like, again, the emotional investment you feel from Foggy and uh, and uh, Karen, you know, what they feel towards Matt and all that. And some of the arcs we the did were paid off. Yeah, the stakes were the biggest issue and what happened with Alexandra. But overall, see, episodes 1 through 6... I'd probably rate those more in the nine, nine and a half range because those ones on repeat watch, I really yeah. love those episodes a lot more. 
Uh, but again, I thought this show, again, had great interactions, had pretty good dialogue between the characters. Uh, visual, visually wise, special effects uh, uh, wise, there were some cool shots with the Iron Fist yeah. and, and seeing that repeat shot from Luke Cage. And, and Madame Gao got to do some cool she, shit. She too. got to do some cool things and Jessica Jones got to punch her with an oxygen tank or something, yeah. which is pretty funny. Her and Luke Cage doing teamwork. Uh, that was pretty cool. I liked the, uh, some of the fights were done really well. Uh, that one, the first fight we got to see between all of them, I, I, fight, yeah. I was up and cheering. I wish I would have been around yeah, to see, yeah, to, yeah. with you to see that, but I was up and cheering going crazy. Uh, there was a lot of good stuff in here. There were a couple things I, you know, I didn't appreciate, but overall, I found myself enjoying this a lot more on yeah. second viewing, and I still did appreciate it, enjoy it, and I found it entertaining, and I still found myself very invested in these characters, especially a lot more in Danny Rand. I'm still not where I want to be with him, but a lot more than I was at the end of Iron Fist season one. So I like that we did get an interesting villain up until the end of episode six, in my opinion. Uh, and I, again, I did like all that banter and inter interaction between the villains and the conflict that they had. I thought that stuff was compelling and interesting. So, like I said, there was a lot of good stuff that I enjoyed in season one. I think your suggestion of combining all the villains would have been more compelling and, and tension filled. It would have or felt villains made way, that are, are like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just but but point being, there there are some things that could have made it a lot better into what I want. I know you had this show very hyped up and you were more looking for, more forward to it than so the most decided thing I had all year. Yeah, no, and, I, and from that perspective, it didn't hit me because I, I was pretty up there, but maybe it wasn't fair of me to hype it up that much, but that, I'm sorry, that's just what I do. I, I fanboy out a little bit, but again, I really appreciated episodes one through six a lot more the second time through, and I think possibly you would too and maybe yeah. some other people, but I do get the criticisms other people had, including myself, and even you. Like There were some things you even said here that, that that you felt a little negative towards that I didn't fully agree with, but your argument, like you were making good arguments for like where I understood where you were coming from, that it didn't bother me yeah. why that, I'm like, I, I get why yeah. that bothers you. Like you were making good conviction and what, what bothered you. And I feel like I was too. So I, again, I'm not trying to be negative. I let, I really enjoyed the show. I thought it was very entertaining. It was fun. Uh, I think second viewing is a lot better. Like I said, the human interact or the interactions, the human emotion invest, uh, the uh, the uh, the depth and emotion that you get is very. It gets you a lot more invested in in these characters throughout the show again. And I just appreciated it. And I thought some of the action was really cool as well. And some of the cinematography was pretty cool too. But. I, I can't wait to see what we got next. I believe it's Punisher is next, yeah. so I'm really looking forward to that. I still love these shows. Again, didn't hit me where I wanted to, but I still really enjoyed my sh uh, this show, and I'd still give it about an 8 or an 8.5, somewhere around there. So pretty good review. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with a lot of what you said. Uh, my rating's definitely lower. I would give it like a 6.5 or 7, which would still make it fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. That's what counts. That's all uh, that matters. Yeah, I, I definitely enjoyed it more than Iron Fist Season 1. Um, and uh, yeah, there's plenty to appreciate about it. It's just really the last two episodes that really uh, d did a not that kind of ruined a lot of the show for me. But I think the first six episodes are pretty damn solid. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those first six are pretty damn good episodes. And I do feel with the second viewing, even the flaws I found in the first couple episodes would probably be vastly improved uh, with the second viewing, and maybe even the last two as well. So yeah, it's currently 6.5 or somewhere to 6.5 to 7, I, I would give it. But yeah, that's just my overall opinion. And uh, I just want to say too, this is the last video we're shooting in this room no! right now. In terms of this set, this office. Um, it's a sad day. I'm moving back into a studio apartment. The YouTube ads are just... Uh, ter no. <laughs> John, John's moving in. <laughs> John! And, and uh, this is a two-bedroom place. Uh, I've been using this place as an office, so John's going to be moving in. He's going to be having this place to himself. Uh, the, off the office will be in his bedroom now. And I'll uh, be back shooting in the living room. So we're going to bring back the red couch in case you guys missed that. Nice. I missed it. Red couch. Been gone all year. It's coming back, baby. It's coming back. Uh, Andrew, thank you for being here, providing your wonderful insight and knowledge, my friend. Greg, thank you for having me. Please do yourself a favor and follow Andrew at the Movie Source channel on YouTube. He clearly knows what he's talking about. He's clearly a Only when I steal from him. Only when he steals from me. That's what he does best. That's what we do in Hollywood. He's like, I'm like the advisor and he's my Trump. That's how I do this. So go check out Andrew on the Movie Source channel, Agor711 on Twitter and Instagram. You can subscribe to The Real Rejects, click that notification bell, and check out our Patreon. Become a Patron eject today. Do it. Much love to all of you. Check out our Smokedown. Bye.